Let's see what we got going on here. What I really want to do is um, spend the emphasis on eschatology. There can be a lot of deep doctrinal issues that we could trace throughout Scripture and um, pull a lot of information together. Um, but I want to try to keep this whole study down to about a year or so, you know, one study every week, and we could we could make this go two years easily, and uh, so I don't I don't think I want that to happen. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just pick up and hop, skip, and jump through the first three chapters. Um, don't hate me. You could spend uh, on chapters two and three. We could spend easily one week per church of the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches. Um, again, in the interest of, of shortening things, I will not, although the last couple, the last two churches, because they're so significant, and, and I hope that'll become clear once we get there, um, we will spend a, a little time on those more so than the others. But I just want to kind of give an overview and give some context. And, and so that's why it's important for us to, to uh, look at the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's, begin, let's begin at the beginning. Um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to the servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, I've mentioned this before, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to reiterate. Um, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ. In the Greek, uh, um, ap apocalypsis. Um, now, we tend to hear that word apocalypse and the way it's used in, in media, the way it's used in, in movies and television is uh, when something is the end of the world and it's utter destruction, then everybody's running around with their hair on fire saying, ah, oh, it's the apocalypse. You know, woe is me. Um, the apocalypse does not per se mean the utter destruction and the end of all things, um, although... In this book, it is the revealing, the apocalypsis, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ. So um, it does mean the end of all things for some people, but the apocalypse does not mean a big destruction. A lot of times people will use um, in the same vein, that's Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is more close to what most people mean when they're yelling you know, ah, the apocalypse. So the apocalypse is the revealing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is more prophecy in the scriptures about the second coming of Christ than the first. And it's because um, all of the promises of the Old Testament are going to bring us to this point, this peak, this pinnacle of the second coming of Christ where he comes to earth and he um, establishes his kingdom on earth. You know, the, the high point of, of all events of Scripture have been, been leading to this. Redemption had to happen first, and now we're realizing that redemption in the glory of Christ. We are all, we are all glorified. And um, then it just gets better from there. So the other thing, the um, apocalypse is not is um, there is a genre that uh, many people have heard called apocalyptic literature. Um, apocalyptic literature, for some people, means um, well, it's it's very very allegorical language, very figurative language. So we can't really know for sure what all the meaning is. Um, 
and quite how to understand it because because it's this genre of apocalyptic language, stuff about the uh, end times with all this symbolism and all this stuff reading in the book of Revelation and other apocalyptic literature like Daniel in the Old Testament or Ezekiel in the wheel within the wheel. So because it's so figurative and it's all visions and uh, symbolism, we can't understand it. So um, it's very, very difficult to understand. You know, it's, it's very murky, very cloudy. So it takes, you know, um, whomever to understand it. Uh, great minds to understand and comprehend. Great theologians struggle with it over the millennium. And uh, so that's just the genre of apocalyptic literature. And that's the opposite of what the apocalypse means. The apocalypse means the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Um, Again, as I like to say, it's, this book is not the obfuscation of Jesus Christ. God isn't here trying to confuse us. God is not the author of confusion. Um, God is revealing things. Now, it's 2,000-year-old language. John is trying to um, write down what he has seen in, um, in visions, what he's been told. Um, and a lot of it looks like, reads like, um, they weren't necessarily just visions or, or strange dreams that somehow after some fashion John was there. God time traveled him. Um, I don't know. He can do whatever he wants. Um, we know that this kind of a thing happened to um, Paul, where Paul was caught up into the third heaven for a time. And it appears that, that um, John was too. We see him before the throne of grace. Um, coming up very soon. So, trying to parse which parts are vision and which parts are um, John is there witnessing them because God exists outside of time. So, God pulling John in to see events as they happen is, is not outside of his purview. Probably the visions will be the things that we see that aren't you don't normally see uh, on earth. Uh, if there's something having to do with these beasts, these four beasts, or a red dragon, this kind of thing, these might be this type of thing, would probably be the visions that God gives them. And then God reveals this symbolic language, because there is some symbolic language in the book of Revelation and in other books. He tells them the meaning. He tells us the meaning. He tells John the meaning. He tells Daniel the meaning um, in many cases. So, also, um, a way to understand this is, is revelation. As God reveals himself, he started telling his story and his plan of redemption back in Genesis. And then we, as we go through the scriptures, he's exposing more and more. So in that sense, um, prophecy is uh, it's progressive. God is revealing himself in a progressive fashion over time. So as he goes, things become more and more clear. So we can look back at what he said before and pull it all together and, and kind of comprehend a little bit better what the Lord is trying to say. So, the revealing of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the obfuscation of Jesus Christ. So, um, his servant John, in verse 2, bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So, John actually saw these things. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, that's a promise. That is one of the few places. This is for the whole book. It's not just for if you behave a certain way, God's going to bless you. This is a blessing for uh, the entire book of Revelation. And that's something unique you find in this book, is that there's a special blessing for those who who read it, read it aloud, the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who, who hear and those who, who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So it's kind of a threefold blessing that, that the Lord offers. So we would do well to take heed uh, to that and, and to um, enjoy the blessing. So, so here John, John says he's writing to the seven churches that are in Asia. 
Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. So he's writing to churches that are in Asia Minor, modern Turkey. Um, him who was and is to come. Um, and it, it uh, the firstborn is Prototokos. Proto, Prototokos might sound kind of familiar, similar to other words we've heard. And it's from whence we get the word for prototype. So it's the original, the OG. So Jesus is the OG. He is the preeminent. He's the most important from among the dead. Jesus and the apostles raised some from uh, the dead before Jesus ever raised from the dead, but Jesus is the preeminent one to raise from the dead. So it has to do with importance and priority, um, not chronology. So firstborn doesn't necessarily have to do with the first one born. We know this from Jacob and Esau, right? So Jesus was not chronologic, chronologically the first to raise from the dead. Uh, Lazarus is one such example. He's another one there. Um, Jairus' daughter, that kind of thing. Um, so most important of, of uh, all the doctrines, possibly, um, Paul alluded to that in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 28. He said that if uh, there's no resurrection, we're still, we are yet in our sins. So this is a extremely important doctrine to, to understand and to know. Um, so uh, he has freed us from our sins by his blood. So this is um, this is important to know um, and comprehend that this is a, a done deal. It's it's happened in the past. What we have here is is we see the uh, red dot in the middle of Patmos, and that's where John is writing his letters. And there are the seven churches there in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And there's a reason why he was assigned those particular churches of all the churches in the area to write to. There are a number of churches missing. Where's Corinth? Why is there not uh, a letter to Corinth? See, it's way off over there to uh, the left of your screen, or why not the church at Jerusalem? So there's some big major churches that we're familiar with. What about Colossae? Notice there's not a letter to Colossae. Well, first of all, these are the letters that Jesus himself dictated to John and wanted them distributed, and he gave them in a particular order. And the reason for the order, um, we could look at it in a number of ways, and this is somewhat debated and disputed, but it serves to uh, take a look and see these churches and, and the reason why. Give me a moment here. Okay, here, this particular chart um, is, I believe, through Arnold Fruchtenbaum. But notice these seven churches. These churches are, are uh, here on this chart in the order that um, Jesus gave them to John. And notice that uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum has them here in um, an order like on a timeline. And he's not the only one to do this. Many, many, many through the years have done this. I don't know if I that I completely agree with the years and, and there, there's some flexibility here. In fact, I know I don't quite agree with these years here. But um, you decide yourself. There's some flexibility here, depending on what is stated to these different churches um, during the uh, over the centuries in the letter and how they match up. So, um, one application of these churches obviously is directly to these literal churches that existed at the time. They had these issues at the time, and Jesus was addressing these concerns to them. That's one application. Application number two would be 
to various churches, our own churches. And we might have leanings in certain areas in our respective churches where some of these issues that are being addressed are issues that we might have in our churches. And also there's the personal application because we might be of a certain mindset depending on where we are at in our lives and what things we are going through where the Lord is speaking to us and might burden our hearts with um, where we're at, what we're thinking, what our attitudes are, those kinds of things. And that's, uh, you know, those are all personal things between uh, us individually and the Holy Spirit. But now, for our interest here, let's examine the one that a lot of people will chafe at, and they'll say, no, no way. Um, I think... Probably in the premillennial perspective, very few people dispute um, that there is this kind of timing that goes on. And I don't know when along the centuries people figured it out, but there appears to be kind of a timeline here um, that happened. And as you read through um, some of these letters to the churches, you might see that they do generally, can't stick a pin in these dates, but they do generally line up with um, the overall state of the church in general at that time. Um, you know, they had Ephesus, and it was the apostolic church. You had the church of Smyrna, and it was under Roman persecution up through the early part of the 300s. Pergamum was the, the age of Constantine. He was a, an emperor who came to Christ. And um, he declared Christianity not just now legal, but now the official state religion. This created all kinds of issues um, in his naivete. Kicking this off, it started um, it started some heavy handedness, some legalism, and and some bad traditions and so forth. So that by the time we get up into the 600s and up into the 1500s. You have the Roman Catholic Church, the Dark Ages, and uh, and as we read that letter in particular, some of the things he said to them, and he emphasizes works um, a couple times in that letter, and you'll see how that matches closely. So somebody somewhere along the line figured out that, hey, this kind of matches where we're at right now. So then you get into the 1500s there, and you're you're getting into the age of, you're in the age of Reformation, really. And like I said, there's some overlap here, but... Um, then you've got the, the 1500s and, and uh, up well into the mid-1600s. Um, the Church of Philadelphia was the faithful church. As Arnold has it written here, um, the missionary movement up from the mid-1600s to the 1900s. Uh, I would say that it goes beyond 1900, and the reason why is because it's the faithful church. And uh, we're, we will look at um, that particular church more closely when we get there into uh, chapter 3. And the reason why I think that goes up to, through our, our, our current area, but there's some overlap also of Laodicea, this age of apostasy. I think we're in now, and I think that and obviously um, the unbelievers in that church, which unfortunately are probably the majority, there's no probably about it, they are the majority, are going to be going into the um, tribulation period. So those two definitely overlap. Um, the Laodicea church, I would say, um, I don't know that you'd say as early as 1900. I think whoever um, originally came up with that date was probably pessimistic about the time they're in, and they probably saw foreshadowings of things that were coming down the pike, um, you know, with with a lot of um, compromise and so forth, and the great American cults that were beginning, things like this. But particularly, you get 1960, and God is kicked out of the schools, prayer is kicked out of the schools. The, came a big paradigm shift um, and even behaviors in the world was more mixing into 
church culture and and uh, so forth and there became a blending and that blending has certainly increased now to where um, many churches today are unrecognizable really as a church they're more like concert venues and so forth and plays and so forth and they are um, centers of, of worship through church sharing the word of God so I thought that would be instructive so we'll close out of this chart now and we'll We'll continue in the text in Revelation. Okay, so, so now we pick up in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Um, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. This is the Trinity. The entire Trinity is here, the seven spirits um, a, a better translation for that is probably the sevenfold spirit um, seven attributes of the spirit that are revealed in uh, Isaiah and that's another study it's very fascinating but it's uh, seven is the number of perfection so this we have the Trinity here we have the Father Son and Holy Spirit all um, mentioned here in this passage to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever it's worthy to point out that in verse 5 to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by blood verse 6 and made us in the Greek a kingdom of priests to his God and Father so we are a kingdom of priests which is fascinating that God has uh, called us all to a priesthood uh, we intercede for one another in our in our prayers and so forth and um, so again it's there's a lot of serious doctrine a lot of theology there we could get into and, and spend a whole week on that alone what we are seeing here is language that is particular to the second coming and not the rapture the reason why is because Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. So this is about, since we have not just uh, believers seeing him come in the clouds, but unbelievers, and all the tribes of the earth will wail, they'll be mo moan, mourning uh, on account of him, even so. Amen. This is this is second coming. Because what we read about the... the um, the rapture is it's as in the days of Noah. This is what Jesus said, of course, as well. As in the days of Noah, or um, he comes like a thief in the night, very thief-like. Well, you might mourn after you realize the thief has been there, and you come in and you find that, that you've been ripped off. But <clears throat> a thief in the night is caught completely off guard. In the days of Noah, the people on the earth who rejected Noah and his God, um, they're caught completely off guard. There's no mourning there, and probably until, I don't know how deep the water got before there was mourning, but they were the ones who were caught off guard. Um, but to clarify who who he is coming in the clouds and every, night, every eye will see him and those who pierce him will see him. And who the him is, is in verse eight, I am the Alpha and the, Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come the Almighty. Now, a Jehovah Witness will tell you, well, you know, that's Jehovah. That's God right there. Um, that's Jehovah God that, that's speaking of, because they know in the Old Testament um, that, particularly in Isaiah, that Jehovah God, or Yahweh, uh, is known as Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Almighty. So they know that Alpha and Omega, or beginning and end, um, a to Z, he's everything, all-consuming everything. Um, the beginning and the end, he is the Almighty. So they'll say, well, Jesus is not the Almighty, he's God. It's big God, little God is what Jehovah's Witnesses will say. But the problem is, if you go to the last book of Revelation, you could say, well, yes, this is, I agree with you, this is Jehovah, this is Yahweh, but let's look and see who Yahweh is. And you get into the last chapter of Revelation, and... Um, it's uh, quoting Jesus Christ saying this, that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. 
Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, the text says later on. So, um, again, another one of those we could spend a great deal of time on. So, behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen, I am Alpha and Omega, um, says the Lord God, who is and was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom, and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God. So he's suffering persecution and the testimony of Jesus. Um, the dating of this, we will get into um, when we get into the letters because there's a particular dating. Uh, now, amillennial people and um, preterists and so forth, a lot of folks will try to push this backward as a very early date um, around as close to 70 AD or before 70 AD as possible because otherwise that's the only way that this really works to where they can say all these events happen symbolically or figuratively um, during the you know this whole tribulation period is a tribulation period that happened in the past so it's a done deal put a bow on it stick a fork in it it's done so we'll push the date back so I just want you to keep this in mind um, because um, most historical sources will say, or the, or the more reliable ones at least, will say that, that John was um, exiled to Patmos and he's there during the reign of Domitian. So that pushes it back to a later date, more like in the 90s, mid-90s, that uh, John was exiled to Patmos. Um, again, we'll, we'll get there. Um, so he says uh, in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So that was what the voice behind him said. He said, write this down. So notice a very interesting and wonderful thing that a lot of people overlook, and that is that, you know, why didn't Jesus write any of the New Testament? Well, in fact, he did. By dictation, he wrote seven different letters. He wrote the seven epistles to the seven churches. These are by dictation from Jesus to these churches. So there's a particular order. So that kind of gives credence to why Jesus wanted uh, this particular order this particular seven to be written and in the order that they were written. So it kind of gives credence to the notion that um, he was he was signaling this uh, time frame that we can look at here and say that, well, it does kind of fit. So you decide. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now here he's um, clearly seeing a vision. Um, did he see actual lampstands? Well, in the vision, he did. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head were white like wool, um, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. There's some language there that you see that lets you know that you are seeing something symbolic. And it is a, a vision, and, and there is symbolic language. And you see words like uh, as, um, because his, uh, his feet are as bronze kind of thing, would be symbolic language. Or um, white like white wool or like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His eyes weren't actual fire, but like fire. So he knows that this is the Son of Man, that this is Jesus. Um, because this has been imparted to him. Uh, out of context, would he realize what he's saying or who he's saying? I think that takes um, God himself revealing it before he would know. It's like the Mount of Transfiguration when the apostles were around standing with Jesus. So, for instance, uh, an example of this is much the way Jesus looked when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he was standing between Moses and Elijah. 
Uh, how did John and the other disciples know it was Moses and Elijah? They saw Jesus go up there, and there's two guys standing up there. It's doubtful they had name tags. It said Moses, and Elijah had one. It said Elijah. It's very doubtful they had name tags like that. But somehow they knew the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. Okay, continuing on. We're going to get through chapter 1, I promise. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And this is language we get from the Old Testament um, that has to do with judgment. So he's coming in judgment here. This again goes back to everybody seeing him come and all the nations of the world seeing him and mourning because he's coming in judgment. And this is what John is seeing. So what John is seeing is this, this Jesus. First time he came as a lamb, this time he's coming as a lion. So here he's seeing the same the same Jesus who's coming in judgment. So uh, somebody might naturally ask the question, aha, coming in judgment, that's second coming, that's not rapture. Well, it is, it's rapture for the earth. And that fits the language at the rapture where the tribulation week is a time of judgment upon the earth, a time of wrath, God's wrath on the earth. We're the bride of Christ. God is not going to be pouring wrath down on his bride. Instead, we're brought out and like a thief, we are stolen away from the world and no more salt and light uh, upon the earth. Uh, so it's still judgment. So his voice was like the roar of many waters, loud and booming. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. That's a, that's a visual for you. Was that literal? Again, it's symbolic language. But we understand what he's saying, that it's judgment. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. That's burning, bright, sun, uh, the tongue cuts. Um, his, out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. So it's, it's that same kind of a thing. Um, so this is the vision that John is giving. He's coming, he's coming in judgment, and it's, it's big and it's bold. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Again, it goes back to the earlier language, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Take that, Jehovah's Witnesses. When did Jehovah die, and behold, he's alive forevermore? Only if Jehovah is also Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is also Jehovah, right? And I have the keys of death in Hades. So he's the one who holds the keys. No, he never had to go down into hell and wrestle it away from Satan. Satan never had the, the keys of death in Hades. Uh, they were never in his hand. So Jesus has them. And uh, again, he says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, here's the outline for the book of Revelation, write the things which you have seen, those things that are, and those things that are, to take place after this. Now, write the things, therefore the things that you have seen. Um, I personally am of the view, I like the idea that John writing the Gospel of John, which would have been around the same time, um, could easily have been written from Patmos. So John um, writes the things that he's seen, and that was the things concerning Christ in his first coming. The things, uh, those that are, are the seven churches, the whole church age, or dispensa dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the church, the body and bride of Christ, and the things that are to take place after this, after church, after the church era. Um, after this is meta tauta, the things that happen, certain specific events that happen, meta tauta after this. Uh, stick a pin in that phrase because the, the things that take place after the things that are are the future things, right? The things that are, are where we're at now. Now, people wanting to push the book of Revelation's writing back as close to 70 AD as possible, we would like to say that the things that take place after this is, is um, has to do with the things after 70 AD. Well, even that doesn't quite fit, and we'll get into that, but it's, you know, nice try, but um, no. Meditata, after this, and he, he goes in chapter 4 on through the continuation of the rest of the book are the things that take place after um, after the church age, after the things that are. 
present tense. So I can advance this here. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars. Now, see, this is what I mean about symbolic language is that unless you have good precedence for saying oh, it's symbolism, um, you shouldn't just automatically declare something as symbolic because you don't understand it. Real symbolic language most of the time in Scripture is disclosed eventually. It gets disclosed in the passage or it's revealed also in the, the Old Testament where you find um, such things revealed, used in the past. Um, and we will see more examples of those in the book when we get there. So as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Um, so he's writing to the angels um, of the seven churches. Now, some people will say that those are seven little angels, and that's a possibility. And others will say angels are the pastors. So let's take a look at this. Angels, angel means generally messenger. So to the uh, messengers at the seven churches, are they literal angels? We don't really have in scripture where um, angels messages are given to angels and the angels give them to the pastors or give them to the churches. We don't see this in any of Paul's letters in any of the epistles, certainly. Um, we don't have anything where Paul says, hey, um, you know, an angel delivered this to me. So here you go, Corinth. I'm, I'm giving this letter now to you. I'm going to pass it on to you. This came directly from, from Gabriel or whatever. We don't really find that kind of language in the scripture. Um, messages and and there's some of them are praises and some of them are are discipline and judgment for these churches why would god hold these angels um, accountable for the behavior of the churches these are angels up there in the third heaven with him and so god is telling him okay because you've done this from now on this is going to happen to you unless you repent and the angels up there in heaven go what what did i what did i do okay so this is this is the pastor Pastor, a lot of pressure on pastors. Um, very often how a pastor goes, a church goes, but a lot of times churches do go rogue. Paul saw this regularly. Timothy saw this regularly. But the pastors are the ones who are set there to, to it's a heavy responsibility to um, shepherd the flock. And um, so some of the things that Jesus is criticizing these churches for in, in my opinion, are specific things that the shepherd had um, sway over as far as um, influence on the church. So um, these aren't things that where the church is misbehaving. Otherwise, Jesus's words to the churches would be, you need to listen to your pastor. And that's not what's going on here. So we see something where... Um, these are something that the churches are doing and misbehaving, and yes, they're responsible themselves and so forth, but um, the, the angels or the pastors in particular have some sway in these areas over these churches. So um, Jesus is telling them how to get their act together and what's going to happen to them or not. Now, of these churches, we're going to get into next time, we see that uh, two churches receive some criticism and, um, or not, I'm sorry, the other way around. Two churches do not receive criticism. Um, two churches do not receive any praise. It's just all criticism. So we're going to take a look at these and see if we're going to look at the letters to the churches and we're going to see how they wash out in the next lesson. I told you we're going to try to fly through this because the emphasis is going to be on end times eschatology and the timing of things. The timing of things are all kind of uh, wonky in most cases. So this is, this is these are the things that we uh, wish to address. And by we, I mean me. So until next time.